morning of uh, just, you know, try to get my heart and mind ready for the service today and just sit and stop thinking about the, how the Lord is worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Mm-hmm. He's worthy of our worship. And Revelation says that one day uh, those saints that are already in heaven um, will see the Lord open a book with seals. And those seals, uh, uh, that book is a book of judgment. And all heaven declared, you know, who is worthy to open the book? And John, as he saw it, boy, he began to weep because it seemed like nobody in heaven was worthy to open his book of judgment. You know, there was nobody worthy that could that could stand there and open this, break the seal of this book. And then the angel that was there with him said, oh, don't weep. Because there's one that's in the midst of the throne, the Lamb of God. He is worthy. About that time he says that, all of a sudden, heaven's chorus is open up and they begin to sing a new song to sing about the worthiness of Christ. And he said, what, what do they point to as worthiness? They point it to as worthiness because he is who he is. Amen. He's the son of God. But worthy as well because of, of the act of salvation he performed on our behalf through his mercy and grace. He's worthy because even though he's all God, all holy and sinless, he still stooped himself down to this earth as a perfect sinless life, got on the old rugged cross, was buried and raised again. And because of that, he's worthy today. He's worthy for us to sing to him. He's worthy for us to give. He's worthy for us to pray. He's worthy for us to listen to his word today. So we look at his word this morning. Go ahead and stand, if you will, at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. We're going to look starting in verse um, verse number 8. If you look along with me here, Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called in circumcision by that which is called the circumcision the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. 
But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, by, were, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the spirit, with the saints, and of the Holy Ghost of, or of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. In whom also in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we come to you once more today and thank you for this, uh, this wonderful opportunity we have this morning to be in your word. God, we pray that you please help your word to be effectual in our hearts this morning, that your spirit would move amongst us today and that we'd be changed by your word. That God, we wouldn't come in and just uh, be rejuvenated by fellowship. That Lord, we wouldn't uh, just come in and have a, a good time. But Lord, that we'd be here engaged with you by your spirit, through your word, and that we'd be changed eternally for it. We pray for the one that might be here this morning who does not know you as their Savior. God, I pray that today that it would be the day they would place their faith for forgiveness of sins and eternity with you in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Lord, that they wouldn't leave comfortable in their sin, that they would leave convicted if they don't receive you today. And Lord, we pray that you'd give us an opportunity to share that good news with them. Lord, we pray you'd bless uh, the, the, the saint this morning, the one who's here that knows you, and that, God, you'd help us to be ever closer to you. We love you. We commit these things to your hands now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, and please be seated today. There it is. All right. So the last several weeks, we have been talking about the, uh, the church. We've been talking about the, uh, how the, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit of God moves in the church. We've we been talking about edification and how through these things, we, it, we can be light in the Lord. But as we look at being a light in the Lord, we must understand that the only way we can be light is to, first of all, as we said the last several weeks, to walk in the Spirit. You know, they that are in the Spirit will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, the Bible says. So if we're going to walk in the Lord, we must walk in the Spirit of God. We must walk being filled with the Spirit. And there is a difference, by the way, between having the Spirit of God that's, which, that's a gift given to you upon the day of salvation. And being filled with the Spirit, which is a command. We are to seek every day to live filled with the Spirit of God. And this is an amazing reality. Because if we are, you, you, you know, we see it, if we just think through it logic a little bit here. If I'm spending my time in the morning getting my head and my mind right to be filled with the Spirit, then I'm spending a lot less time thinking of carnal temporal things, aren't I? I have a whole lot less time to be distracted with the, with the trinkets of this world and the allures of the flesh because I'm focused on who? On the Lord. And that's why the apostles say, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so, uh, understand this morning, as we talked uh, even last week, uh, we understand that uh, if we're going to grow in the Lord, if we're going to be a new construction by edification, we must be allowing the Holy Spirit to make us an altered construction. We have to be transformed from the inside out. And that means that there's this process of sanctification taking place where God is deconstructing us in the natural sense and reconstructing us in the image of His dear Son. And that creates an altered, cohabit an altered cohabitation. We saw in the first few verses of our text this morning that we were afar from Christ. We were strangers to Christ. We were enemies of God by being aligned with this world. But through Jesus Christ, we have been brought into His family by the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. We also have an, an altered compulsion. You see in verses 9 through 10 there, not of works lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so, first of all, our priority must be that we walk in the Spirit, but as a result of walking in the Spirit, we must then endeavor to walk in good works. The good works don't save us, and the good works don't keep us, but the good works proclaim the gospel working within us. And that's the important reality. 
And so this morning, as we look further at this thought of a new construction by edification, we must look at the foundation of the church, because the second tool that God has given us to help us in this process of growth is, yes, uh, 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 the, the uh, Holy Spirit using the Word of God, but also how the Word of God works through His church. And we'll be here for a few weeks by God's, uh, by God's grace. I'm not, I want to make sure we follow the Lord's leadership, amen, but uh, there's a lot you could preach on the church, amen, because the church is important. The church is so vastly important. The church helps us to understand. Uh, 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 the, the church helps us to understand the Word of God. It helps us be faithful to God. And, and, and Christ puts so much into the church. You say, well, how much did He put into it? Go across a few pages to Ephesians chapter 5 and look, at, with, look with me with this. Or look with this at, with me. Whew, I'm tongue-tied today. Y'all pray for me. It's been one of them mornings already. Uh, God's been good though, amen. And we trust in His Spirit to help us today. Ephesians 5, and you look in verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives. You realize, husbands, it's God's command you love your wife. I don't feel like I love her anymore. That's not the point. You choose to obey by faith, and I'm going to love my wife, and the feelings will follow. Brother Ryan told on that this morning. Faith comes before feelings, and you can't put feelings before faith. I just, you know, how many of y'all had a bad day? Okay? Everybody has bad days, all right? I guarantee you, Miss Nobumi can give us some testimonies of the LT having some bad days. <laughs> I guarantee Miss Deb can get up here and give some testimonies about Brother Dan having some bad days, amen? I mean, I'm sure she's got a, a, a good uh, 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 a meat mallet in her drawer somewhere. She's thinking, man, one of these days I'm going to take it to this. <laughs> Don't do that, okay? Man, that's not good. Uh, hey, we all have bad days. And what happens in marriage is, is we start relying on feelings and emotions and circumstances to, to define our marriage. And we stop choosing to love our spouse. We start uh, choosing to live by our feelings, emotions, and circumstances. I'm telling you, that will wreck your marriage. This is why God says, husbands, love your wives. Here's the thing. Look, look at the rest of it. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. Oh, go in your mind's eye to Gethsemane. And see Jesus there hunched over a rock, uh, sweating as it were great drops of blood for you and for me. And what were His words? Father, if it be possible that this cup can pass from me, if there's any other way that your church can be redeemed, if there's any other way your will can be accomplished, if there's any other way, let it be so. Nevertheless, not as I wilt, but as thou wilt. It was a conscious choice that Jesus hung on that cross. It wasn't some mechanical compulsion that hung Jesus there. It was a passionate desire to redeem you to his side. And husbands, you all love your wife that way. Verse 26, and what, how does that represent, how does that uh, blossom, what, what does the picture grow to? Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. You understand this morning that Jesus gave his very lifeblood to redeem you and to bring the church into existence. There was a great price paid for the church. And if Jesus is going to pay that price for the church, I think church might just be a little important. You say, well, what is church? Go back to our text here, if you will, and look in verse number 20. Because there is a Sanctification that takes place in, instantly in the life of the believer when they get saved. They are translated from the world into the family of God. They are placed from one, one place to another. But there's also a progressive sanctification that takes place whereby you are being built into the image of Christ. The, we have already said over and over the last few weeks, I'm not going to beat a dead horse, okay? Amen. But we, the Holy Spirit is crucial for that, for that sanctification to take place. You must follow the Spirit of God. You must seek to fill with the Spirit of God. But you also have to utilize the other tools that Christ has given us to grow. And that includes the church. But what is the church? How would you define the church? 
Well, you find here, verse 19, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. If we're going to biblically define the church, we could say it this way, that the church began in its insemination with Christ and the apostles. As Christ called out the apostles to follow Him, He said he was, beginning, he was laying the groundwork for the church. And it must be that way. This is why the Bible says in verse 20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ Him alone being the chief cornerstone. What, what did Jesus tell uh, Peter? He said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for, spirit and, uh, uh, for flesh and blood have not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you that upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What's he saying there? He's saying, look, uh, it's important you recognize who I am, Peter, because I am the rock that the church is built upon. He's the cornerstone. How many of y'all have ever done construction before? All right. Uh, that cornerstone's important, isn't it? If you don't have a, if you don't have a, a level plumbed out, good piece to start with in that foundation, the whole foundation is crooked. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. If Jesus is not part of the foundation of the church, the whole entity becomes corrupt, crooked, and fragile. So Jesus must be the chief cornerstone, but He Himself has allowed the apostles and prophets, that is, the apostles He taught and the prophets of the Old Testament, the witness of the Old Testament and the law and the prophets, to be the foundation of what the church is. To simplify it, if you, if you will, the Bible, the apostles, and Jesus Christ and a, and a, a, a must be what the church is built upon. We can say it this way in a simple definition. A, 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 ch a biblical church is a group of saved, baptized believers that are joined together voluntarily by the will of God for worship, service, and edification. I'll say it again. A church, a biblical church, is a group of saved, baptized believers that are joined together voluntarily by the will of God for worship, service, and edification. Turn to Acts chapter 2, holding your place here, and we'll see this. Y'all pray for me. The devil hates the church. And I, and I, need, your help. I, need, I need God's Spirit's help this morning to help teach this. Because I don't trust me. But I do trust this book. And he needs God's wisdom this morning to use it rightly. Acts 2, verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel, this is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, and foreknowledge of God ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now that's the death of Jesus Christ, amen? Whom God hath raised up, that's the resurrection, having loosed the pains of death. That's the burial. So what is Peter preaching right now? He's preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What do we call that in a simple term? The gospel. Amen. That's what it is. For David speaketh concerning him, verse 25, and I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. And... Um, Neither shalt, wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that at the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith, uh, he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly 
that God hath made that same Jesus whom he hath crucified, both Lord and Christ. The Jew might say today, you cannot see in the Old Testament Jesus Christ, and I say that is heresy. The Bible makes it clear. Jesus himself even saying, that it, you look in, the, look in the law, look in the, look in the Pentateuch, look in, in, the, in the books of, of the prophets, you, in, in them you think you have life, but in them these things are spoken concerning me. Jesus said, I am the one, I'm the focal point of the Scriptures. And you go back all the way to the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, and what you'll find all the way through every book of the Bible is a scarlet cord woven in and out of every verse pointing to Jesus, pointing to Jesus, pointing to Jesus. Why? Because there was coming a mystery called the church, and Jesus was going to establish it in His very lifeblood in our forgiveness, in our sanctification. That's what Peter's preaching. And he says to them, this same Jesus whom David is referring to, this Lord that, Jesus, that David's referring to, whom ye have crucified, but he is both Lord and Christ. Verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted. We killed him. Could you imagine that moment? The entire Old Testament pointed to the becoming of Messiah. Daniel's prophecies pointed to when Messiah would come. Isaiah pointed to when Messiah would come. Ezekiel pointed to when Messiah would come. All they had to do was be... It was so clear that some wise men from the East were wise enough to perceive that this was the time appointed when the King should come. Where is He? Could you imagine their frustration when they enter in Jerusalem to the very king's, to, to uh, Herod's household in the, pal in the palace there? Where, who, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Where, where is he? Surely you're, you're welcoming him in fanfare. Where, where's the royal, uh, uh, um, the, the royal nursery? Where, where's the family? Where is he? We want to worship him. We want to present to him gifts. And Jerusalem is quiet. Bethlehem's quiet. No one's looking for the Messiah. But these wise men from the east, they missed it. And then he comes and proclaims himself. He goes into the, into the temple and he reads Isaiah. He reads the prophecy concerning himself and he says, in This day is the scripture fulfilled. He says to the, to, the, to the Pharisees, he says to the Sadducees, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Abraham rejoiced to see me. I sat with him. They, oh, you're about 30 years old. Who do you, who, and you have Abraham to your father? We have Abraham to our father. And, and he said, who do you think you are? And he said, before Abraham was, I am. Declaring him to be the eternal Son of God. You say, how do you know that? That was what he was proclaiming. Because they went to stone him. For, and, they, and he says, well, what are you stoning me for? For blasphemy. Because thou makest thyself equal with God. See, the Jehovah's Witnesses out there and the Mormons out there say Jesus never proclaimed himself to be God. That's a lie. Just read the Bible. And you'll find it right there, plain and red and black and white. They had missed it. And then the, the penultimate moment of the whole experience. Pilate gets up there and he has a, a, a Barabbas on one side and Jesus on the other and he knows that Jesus is innocent. He knows Jesus has done nothing worthy of Roman crucifixion. The terrible, dreaded, capital punishment of Rome for the most desperate malefactors. Jesus was not worthy of this. And so he tries to take a loophole. Who, who will you have me deliver to you? Barabbas, this terrible serial killer and serial thief or Jesus and they said give us Barabbas and, G and Pilate what does he do he, he does the political thing because they, they threw something in his face that day they said oh you're not Caesar's friend now many of us would read over that and say well who you're not, what is that playground insults you know it's, ooh, you're not Caesar's friend no he, it's a political coined term. It was Those who had the title of Caesar's friend attached to their names had free and unfettered access to Caesar. They could do things without the, the normal bureaucracy because they had the trust of Caesar. 
And so they were saying, the Pharisees and the Jews gathered together that day were saying, hey, Pilate, you don't do this. We're going to complain to Caesar about you. And he, he collapsed. He tried to capitulate the crowds. He walked over to a, had a basin of water brought to him and he ceremonially put his hands in the water and washed them and said, this day are my hands clean of the blood of this man. And they said, and this is the penultimate moment, the Jews cried out, His blood be upon us and our children. Oh, the irony of that statement. They said it in hatred, but they had no idea they needed it in actuality. Because we are saved by the blood of the crucified one. They had no idea. They had missed it in their hatred, in their self-righteousness, in their pride, and they crucified him. And finally, Peter gets up to preach full of the Holy Ghost, baptized uh, with, this, with this new gift of the Holy Ghost of God to his church. And he gets up and preaches the best message of his life. He says, you crucified the very Messiah. And you can almost feel it's that moment whenever the whole world just stops. They were broken. They were cut to the heart. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Can you hear the desperation? What do we do? Is it too late for us? Is there mercy for me? Is it too late for us? What does he say? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, there's a lot packed in that verse, amen? But essentially this, the, he preaches the gospel to them. And that word repent, as we defined earlier on, means to take what is said and, and, and accept it as fact and actuality so that it alters your beliefs. So they believed on Jesus Christ, that's salvation. Believing on Jesus Christ, we find from other places in Scripture, is uh, whereby we are then given the, uh, the remission of sins. Romans chapter 10. And baptism is as a result of that salvation experience. And he says, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and obey Him in baptism, you also, in, these two, within, in, that, message, in, that, in that mode of salvation, you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise, verse 39, is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Oh, there's that word again. even as many as call, as the Lord our God shall call. So he preaches the gospel to these people and they get saved. You say, how do you know? Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. What does that gladly receive mean? It means they heard the gospel and they received it in faith and belief. And because of that, they went forward to be baptized in obedience to Christ's command to be baptized. And then we find what happened after that. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. You see, this church, this first church in Jerusalem, was a church to which the gospel was presented. It was comprised of people who had believed and received the gospel. It was comprised of those that had obeyed the Lord's command to be baptized. It was comprised then also of those that, were had, that desired a, to be added to the church. It says, in, it says that they were, uh, I'm sorry, in the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, verse 41. See, there was no church before this day other than the apostles in Christ. There was no, there was no, you didn't have the church of Antioch. You didn't have the church of Corinth. You didn't, all you had was this group of apostles and the disciples that were with them. That was the church. The church was empowered on that day. But here brings another term that we must define. Oh, before we get there, we'll go to this way. because This is kind of introductory, I know, but I want to get, make sure we touch on a few things before we dive deeper into the theology of the church. These were people that didn't just, um, weren't just added to the church. They didn't just have fellowship with other believers. We find it says in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. In other words, they adhered to a unified statement of faith. They believed it was taught. They didn't just bring in their own teachings. They took what the teachings the apostles gave them. Why? Because who did the apostles learn from? 
Jesus. Jesus taught the apostles, and the apostles were then instructed to teach the church. We find that they, these weren't just people that were edified and built up on the apostles' doctrine, but we find also that they were a people of service. You look in verse number 44, And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Verse 45 is not to be confused with communism all right, or socialism. Verse 45 is to be reckoned with the reality that when people put their hearts and minds in the Lord and were saved, they were, trans, they were, they were tr so transformed on the inside that their focus became less on the carnal and more on the eternal. So when they walked in their home, they were like, yeah, I don't think I need that anymore. There's some needs I could, I just heard today when we were, hey honey, I was, I was sitting at the, at the, at the uh, temple today and we were talking with some folks that are, just got saved with us and we saw them getting baptized and they, boy, they, they, they've got some needs and you know, we could meet that need if we sold this land. You know, we, we could meet that need if we stopped, you know, buying this stuff or if we got rid of these things and sold them. Uh, uh, man, I've got an extra, you know, uh, uh, a couple of, of vases. I've got a couple, I've got a couple extra donkeys or, or, or whatever it might be. Maybe I can give that to them and help them out. Maybe get them, you know, back up on their feet or something. What, I don't, I, you could go with, on with all kinds of examples, but the reality was they no longer saw what they had as theirs. They saw it as God's and they lived that way. It was a transformation of the gospel in them to see the people around them as people that if they had a need, that God had given them the power to meet that need by faith. They were a giving church, and they were a serving church. Verse 46, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Hold, go with me to, to a couple pages over to Acts 11 with me. Acts 11. And look at a picture of this. This is now the church in Antioch. Acts 11 and verse number 19. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene. I'm sorry, verse 19, I apologize. And now, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose, am I on the right? Yeah, I am, okay. Um, about Stephen traveled as far as Phine uh, Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So what happened? Uh, the, the apostles and the disciples in Jerusalem, they were preaching the gospel, but they weren't preaching it to everybody. They were only preaching it to the Jews. Because in their minds, well, we're God's people. This is, redemption. This is salvation for us. Surely that's who we're supposed to go to. They were missing the point. And so God's Holy Spirit gets to work. It just so happens there's some men from Cyprus and Cyrene happen to be there and hear the gospel. And they said, boy, I wish well, God can do that for me, right? I need my sins forgiven. I want to be right with God. And they believed and put their faith in Christ. And then they took it with them. And they went back to Antioch. And they taught others the gospel because when you know the gospel and when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can't help but share that gospel with other people because you know the forgiveness of God through the gospel. You know what God's doing in you through the gospel. It's they, boy, they, it got contagious. And all of a sudden, there's all these believers in Antioch and, and they're gathering together and they're worshiping the Lord and word gets back to Jerusalem. And so they send Barnabas. Now, who is Barnabas? He was a faithful man who was actually in the lot to be chosen possibly for one of the, for, the, for the replacement apostle to replace Judas. He was in that, he was in that group. He, that's how faithful this man was. And so this man who was this faithful, they said, Barnabas, we need you to go to Antioch. In verse 23, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad, and it says he exhorted them all with, that with purpose of heart they, should, they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to, uh, to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Now what had happened in here? God was doing something to grow a church in Antioch because this was going to be a launching pad for missions. The Gentile world was about to be turned upside down with the gospel. All because some people were walking in the Holy Ghost 
and God was bringing about the growth of his church. Look at verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. That's guest preachers, amen. <laughs> and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the, unto the, unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it by the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Then you go over to chapter number 13. There's a bit of a hiatus here in the, in the historical account. We see somewhere else happening, but verse 13, we get back to Antioch. Chapter 13, I mean. Now verse 1, Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. What do you see here? You find a church that has received the gospel. These are saved, baptized, joined together, voluntarily serving people that are joined for worship, service, and edification. And we find when the, when the church is focused around that central reality, scripturally speaking, this is a biblical church, and that biblical church is performing great things for Jesus Christ by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. Faith Baptist Church will never be a church that accomplishes all that God has for it if we are not a church body that is not comprised of saved, baptized believers that are voluntarily joined together for the purpose of worship, service, and edification by the will of God. We also must define the apostles. Because there's a lot of confusion on that today. We define the church. But what is an apostle? Well, by nature, just the actual word, it means sent one. Um, some might say missionaries are apostles, but that would be a misuse of the word. Um, as far as the context of Scripture and who the apostles are in title. And this is important because the Bible says that God gave some apostles and prophets so the apostles had a role. We find that back in Ephesians, if we were to go to chapter 2, again, we'll go there for just for this moment. But in Ephesians 2, it says that the church is built upon the apostles and prophets. So who are these apostles? What, what qualifies one to be an apostle? Well, biblically, an apostle is one who is first a first-hand recipient of the teachings of Christ. They must have been somebody who sat at Jesus' literal feet and received teachings from Jesus. We find also they must be first-hand witnesses of the risen Christ. Go to Acts chapter 1 and you'll find this. Because Peter himself gives the qualifications for an apostle. Aren't you glad God's word clarifies this stuff for us? Amen. Dr. Google can be useful for some things. When it comes to the Bible, Dr. Google is not very useful. Amen. I don't want to go to Dr. Google for truth. I want to go to the Bible for truth. Amen. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. Now these are the apostles, amen. These are the ones Jesus called out. Verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120, men and brethren. This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Jesus, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bells gushed out. Boy, Peter getting a little graphic there, you know. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, and so much that, as that that field is called in the proper tongue, Asaladama. That is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric let another take. Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John 
unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, that's another, that's another way of saying Barnabas' name, who was surnamed Justus and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two, men, two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So Peter himself gives us the understanding that, uh, I will, I'll read this from gotquestions.org. It was the most succinct way to, to write this. And I don't want you to think this is my writing, okay? Uh, but the, I, I love the paragraph and the way this is said. Peter proposed choosing a new apostle and set the qualifications. Not everyone could be considered for an apostleship. Candidates needed to have been with Jesus during the whole three years that Jesus was among them. That is, he needed to be an eyewitness of Jesus' baptism when the Heavenly Father validated Jesus' person and work. He needed to have heard Jesus' life-changing teachings and been present to see his healings and other miracles. He needed to have witnessed Jesus sacrifice himself on the cross and to have seen Jesus walk, talk, and eat among the disciples again after his resurrection. These were the pivotal facts of Jesus' life and the heart of the message they were to teach. And personal witnesses were required to verify the truth of the good news. So you understand, there was no New Testament. So the spread of the gospel relied on the true witness of eyewitnesses who weren't just there for Jesus' baptism, but were also there for his resurrection. So they could say, look, it's not, it's not a fairy tale. I was there. I saw it. And it wasn't just me. It was so and so and so and so and so and so and so. And we're not making this up. Because there was a crowd of witnesses. Now look, you might could say one person makes something up. You might could say two people make something up. But when you've got above 700 people that are saying, no, no, I saw Jesus resurrected. When you've got 12 men who walked and talked with Jesus and lived with him for three and a half years saying, no, no, there's nothing inconsistent about his character. This is, this is the one whom our hands have handled. We know him. And what we're telling you is what he gave us. They needed that because there was no canon of New Testament yet. It was being written. And we'll get to that in just a moment. The church began with the apostles. The church was empowered on the day they came to observe the Feast of Pentecost or the, or the Feast of Shabbat. That's what Pentecost was. Pentecost wasn't one day in history. It's not, a, it's not a New Testament church historical thing. It is actually a Jewish holiday, the Feast of Weeks. And, it, and the Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come. This was a Feast of Weeks and there was a, there was a day when it was the pinnacle of the feast. That was this day. So it wasn't like it was some special day for the church to necessarily observe, but rather it was a day that the Jews were already uh, observing. Why? Because this Feast of Weeks, in essence, was a feast to commemorate the, the reunification of God to His people by bringing them out of Egypt unto Himself in the wilderness, and how He brought them out of slavery and, making his, and, 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 and marking His giving them the law to guide them in this new relationship. So the Feast of Weeks was an observance of how God brought them out of Egypt unto Himself and a, really, a celebration of the fact that God was not just going to bring them out of slavery, but gifted them what they needed to live for Him. Do you see it? It's no mistake that, they were, they were, they, that the Holy Ghost came and empowered the church on the day of Pentecost. Why? Because that was a foreshadowing in the Feast of Weeks of what was going to take place on that day with the apostles and disciples. On that day, the fulfillment of the promise took place whereby God poured out His Spirit upon all flesh. Whereby the, then the church that had been called out and the people that had been born again who had been pulled away from the slavery of sin and the slavery of damnation and God was then going to gift them the tools that they need by His church, by His Spirit, and by His Word ultimately to be able to live the Christian life. It was a fulfillment of a prophetic feast on that day. What an amazing reality. God does nothing on accident. It's always at His perfect timing. Now, sometimes we miss it, right? But when it happens, there's no mistaking it. The parallel is obvious. In the day of Shabbat, the disciples and the apostles received the Holy Spirit and, and, and empowered them to launch out fully equipped in this new dispensation of the church bef uh, uh, before God, pouring out His... Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry... New dispensation of the church, whereby God poured His Spirit into His people 
and empowered them to perform the work of the ministry. This is why the church is not an open, transient mashup of random adherents. But we see from the scriptures that the church at large is seen today as it was then in many local assemblies. And those local assemblies are comprised of people who are born again, filled with the Spirit of God, and able to glean through the gifts of God and His Spirit through the things essential to godliness, or those things essential to godliness and righteousness as taught by, from God to the Old Testament prophets and His disciples. And we are still striving to observe their teachings today. A Bible church is still trying to follow the teachings of the apostles. That's why we have the New Testament. You say, how does, where do you see that? Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 42. Again, we read this already. Verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They didn't follow any doctrine. They followed the apostles' doctrine. 2 Peter chapter 3. While you're turning there, I'm going to read this one for time's sake. Jude 1, 17. You guys go to 2 Peter 3. I'm going to read Jude, 7, Jude, Jude 17. Jude 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there was a recall to teach and edify to the words of the apostles. Verse, uh, now in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. This second epistle, beloved, this is Peter writing, one of the apostles, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Remembrance of what? That ye be, may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Peter is equating the teaching of the apostles with the authority of the Old Testament prophets and law. That's pretty brazen if you don't have the authority of God on that. That's what Peter was saying. He goes on, matter of fact, if you were to go back to chapter 1, you'll see what Peter says here further. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. There was something in Peter that helped him realize, wait a minute, I'm going to die. And, there were, and we're losing apostles. James by this time was dead. Others were dying. And Peter thought, thought hmm, I'm not going to live forever. Jesus already told me I was going to die a martyr's death. And he began to think about the reality. What's going to happen after all the apostles are gone? How is the church going to continue? And it occurred to him by the leading of the Holy Spirit of God that you better write these things down. And we have First and Second Peter to, as a result. They were moved by the Holy Ghost to write these things down for our edification. Peter was saying, continue on. He says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. He says, I have, to, I have to do something to make sure that you have this after I die because you must understand that these are not cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were, wit but, um, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the voice which came from heaven we heard, and when we were with him in the holy mount, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. Peter is saying, I know that I'm not going to be here forever. I know that you're not always going to be able to sit and hear me forever as an eyewitness. But I know that just as we've seen some glorious things, just as, just, just as my witness is sure, what's going to happen after me is a more sure word of prophecy. I get so tired and exhausted with these, with these conversations and, and arguments that take place where people try to cast doubt on the Word of God. 
well, you know, the, the Bible contains the Word of God, and, and we know that the, maybe the words of Christ are inspired, and, and maybe the words of God are inspired, but, but not everything's inspired. It's just, just certain things are inspired. Look, if you can't trust one part of God's Word, you can't trust any of it. It's either truth or it's not. There's no middle ground. So stop trying to please people and placate people by trying, well, you know, the Bible was written by people who were imperfect. We're all sinners. And there's, just, there's, there's a chance that somebody writing that word may have messed it up. That's a lie of the Mormons, by the way. They wanted to cast down the word of God. Why? Because they got some crazy guy in the woods who pulled some gold tablets from some dirt and said, hey, this is what God gave me by an angel Moroni. It's a new gospel. Hey, Galatians chapter 1. That should be called heresy and turned away from. But we've got to deceive people, so we've got to turn them from the Bible, from God's word, to believe what Joseph Smith had to say. It's a lie. It's the same thing devil play, the devil played in the Garden of Eden. Oh, well, the Bible contains the word of God. Yeah, hath God surely said... Thou shalt not die. Casting doubt on the word of God. You better stake it down in your heart. Go If you haven't already done so, you get down before God and say, God, I'm tired of doubting your word. I embrace your word as the only standard of truth in my life. My life, and I'm going to live by it. I'm going to love it. I'm going to read it. And when your Holy Spirit convicts my soul about where my life doesn't add up to it, I'm going to change my life, repent of that, and follow your way. You'll never grow and you'll never be fruitful until you put yourself lock, stock, and barrel on the Word of God. Well, I just don't know if I can trust the Word of God. Well, you'll never grow. You'll never grow. As long as you're casting doubt on the Word of God, you'll never, ever, 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 ever grow. Because the Word of God uh, is, is what saves us and the Word of God is what sanctifies us by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 3 Verse 13, Nevertheless, we according to His promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye be found of Him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, by the way, Paul is written to be, is, is called the apostle to the Gentiles. You say, how is he an apostle? Pa Peter, Paul said, I'm an apostle born out of due time. You say, well, Paul wasn't there when Jesus taught. Paul wasn't there. He is a witness of the risen Christ because Jesus himself taught Paul in the wilderness. You see, how does that play out? I don't know. I don't understand it. But in the wilderness of Arabia, Paul had some tent meetings with Jesus. Why? Because he was going to take this apostle and make him an apostle to the Gentiles and take the gospel to them. And so Peter validates his ministry and validates his writings in 2 Peter 3, verse number, six, uh, verse number 15. And account the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in of things in which are some things hard to be understood. How many of y'all ever read one of Paul's epistles and said, what are you talking about, Paul? <laughs> Even Peter said they were hard to be understood sometimes, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. You see what Peter did there? Not only has Peter in his epistles elevated their writings to the level of scripture, but he's also elevated Paul's writings to the level of scripture because they were apostles. So when Bethel Church says, that we have the Word of God too with progressive revelation. When, 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 when Mr. Bill gets up there and puts his big old binder down and says, this is the, this is, God is still revealing Scripture today, you better turn and run. Because unless he's been alive for a very long time and it's at the feet of Jesus, back at 0 AD, he's a liar. People today try to talk about being having new scripture revealed. This this song Jesus, uh, uh, the Jesus talking to her when she wrote this book. I forget what the Jesus speaks or something like that. It was a devotional guide. How Jesus told her new things in the scripture. That's heresy. That's heresy. By the way, you read that and compare it to the Bible, you'll find that who she says is Jesus is saying things that don't line up with scripture. But the foolish and unlearned and unstable, they wrestle with those things because they're not, they're not learned, they're not wise. They don't have the Word of God in their heart. And so what does Peter say? He says, verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 
This is what a true Bible-believing church is comprised of. Now quickly, as we get ready to close, how does a church maintain that? It must be a church of saved, baptized, born-again people that are voluntarily gathered together for the purpose by the, God, by the will of God to serve and worship and to help each other grow. Well, we maintain that first by membership. You know, we act as though this is some business model practice because we see membership like some clubs where you get, a, where you get badges and benefits. Anybody remember the Mickey Mouse Club? I'm going to date myself with that one, all right? All right. Uh, how many of y'all have ever joined a club? And they sent you like a little badge or a little pin or something like that. And see, that's not what church membership is. If you see church membership that way, you'll never join a church because you feel like what you're doing is you're trying to put yourself in with a bunch of people. And, you, and, you're, and, and there's some reticence to that because you say, I, I don't know if I want to have that name on my name. That's not what membership is. Membership isn't joining a club for the, for the badges and benefits. But that's how we treat the church. And that's why people church hop. That's why people go to different church, to church, to church, to church. Why? Because they're looking for the church with the best benefits. Well, I'll go to this church because their children's program is the best. Or I'll go to this church because their music is the best. Or I'll go to this church because they have, they give out donuts but, but in Sunday school. But LT said, amen. <laughs> he said, God, help us be that church. Amen. <laughs> if we see membership as joining ourselves to something that gives us badges and benefits, we're not going to see the church the Bible way. It's going to be a narcissistic way. That's not church membership. So when folks come up here and give their testimony, they're not joining Faith Baptist Church because it gives them some kind of level of, of extra credence or extra benefits. All it does is they're saying, I believe it's God's will that I be a, a, a serving, worshipful, giving part of a local assembly. And so I want to come up here and proclaim to you that I'm saved, I've been baptized, and I believe it's God's will that I join myself with this local body. That's what they're saying. That's all membership is. It is just our, as a church body, saying, we hear you, we've seen your faithfulness, and we embrace you as a member of this local assembly. It's not a business model. It's a Bible model. In the book of Romans, you would find that Phoebe, in the last chapter of Romans, is given a, a, a recommendation by the Apostle Paul. Go, go with me to Romans with me, if you will. Romans chapter 16. Verse number 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister. He's saying, what is he saying there? He's saying, I commend to you this Phoebe. I know she's saved. Do you see it? Which is a servant. Uh oh, she's a faithful member. Which is at, uh, uh, of the church, which is at Sincrea. She's a member of a local assembly who is saved and baptized and serving. That's what it is. And she's moving. Where's she moving? Well, who's this book written to? The church in Rome. She's moving. She's going to be in Rome for a little bit. She's a little nervous that they're not going to receive her because she's a stranger. Hey, we know all about that here, don't we? We got folks come in the door all the time. It's a revolving door at Faith Baptist Church. Folks in and out constantly. And when, when, we, and when folks join the church, we could look at everybody and say, well, welcome in, you're a member of the church. But that's not biblical. And we have folks that attend regularly. That's wonderful. I'm not against that. And we're going to love on you and minister to you as best we can. But I'm telling you, the Bible model is that when you go to some place for any length of time, you better join yourself to a local church. Because it's God's will for your life. You say, how do I know? 1 Corinthians 12, 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased Him. So when God moves you physically to a new location, that means He has a local assembly to attach you to. Verse 2 of Romans 16, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in what sort of business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succor or a helper of many, and of myself also. He's saying, boy, uh, I can attest to her faith. I can attest to her salvation. I can attest to her faithfulness. And when she comes there, when she, when, when she wants to serve, boy, help her serve and trust that she's going to be able to do it well. Because she loves the Lord and she's been faithful at Sincrea. You see it? Romans 
is a deep theological book. But you do realize that as Phoebe carries this letter to Rome, it's basically a lengthy 16-chapter recommendation letter from the Apostle Paul to this church. You see, what does all this mean, Pastor Knight? What does it mean for me? If God places each member for a purpose in the place of his desire, then when I neglect to join or attach myself to the local assembly, I am thereby choosing to halt God's ability to flow through me to be a functioning part that God created me to be. It is no action that you're here today. It's no action that, you, that, that God has a church in this place. I praise God that, that, that in 1982, a church was planted in Iwakuni, Japan, that can minister that base population and those around it. I can't wait till the Oishi gets here and plants a church near Hatsukaichi. Because why? One church can't do it all. We've got to reach people, amen? But it takes people, reaching people, who are saved, baptized, and voluntarily joined by the will of God for the purpose of worship, service, and edification. So that has about a night. Father, we come to you once more today as we close. That we thank you for the day. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the chance to meet together today. And I pray, God, that you'd have your will and way in our lives as we go from here. Help us not to be faithful in a moment, but be faithful through this week. Lord, bring us back together tonight as, as, uh, by your grace and mercy, if you tarry, to worship you again at 6, Lord. And Lord, help us as we prepare our hearts to observe uh, your ordinance at the Lord's table. That we'd be faithful to do it rightly. That our hearts would be pure before you. And Lord, that you could uh, increase the ability of our church to shine brightly for you through all that you do in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope to see you back tonight, 6 o'clock. God bless you. Have a good afternoon. Mm-hmm.